Hey everybody, it's Dr. Dave, Psychiatry. Thanks for coming to the YouTube channel today. If you saw my previous video about uh, a person who had a panic attack, went to the emergency room, and we learned about the controlled breathing protocol and how to not breathe yourself into uh, the emergency room, uh, this is a little more in-depth video, and this is about panic disorder, panic attacks, and uh, how we treat those. So today we're going to talk about GABA. GABA, if you haven't seen the other video, starting with my routine two lines, defining high and low, the normal range. GABA stands for gamma aminobutyric acid. GABA, if you're low on GABA, I'm getting another one. I shouldn't have done that. High, low. Got going too fast. Gamma aminobutyric acid. We typically just teach patients about GABA. If you're low on GABA, that's what we believe causes panic attacks. And um, again, a panic attack is not something that you have when someone points a gun at you. That is an acute stress or fear reaction of somebody actually points a gun at you. If you feel like someone pointed a gun at you and they didn't, that's a panic attack. And when that goes into, uh, I'm scared I'm going to have a panic attack at work, so I'm avoiding work, I'm avoiding buildings, I'm avoiding friends, that's called agoraphobia. I can just write that up here for you, agoraphobia. And you can read a formal definition about that on the internet, but agoraphobia literally translates into fear of the marketplace. So that's just how we talk about the fear of being out when you might have a panic attack. So chemically, the medical uh, problem that we're talking about here, the brain chemistry problem we're talking about, low GABA, we have tools that we believe boost GABA. And if your GABA is low, it needs to be boosted. That's the treatment. If you're here, you need to be here into the normal range. Now, there are a couple of ways to approach this. Uh, GABA, there's one tool that we use to boost GABA uh, that is not a benzodiazepine. We'll talk about benzodiazepines here in a second. It's called buspirone. And the trade name is buspar. So if you're taking buspar, you know someone who's taken buspar, your doctor's prescribed buspar, buspirone, they're using it to boost your GABA. If you don't know what it's supposed to do, that's what it's supposed to be doing. And if it's helping you, keep taking it. The reason I don't use a lot of USPAR is that for most people in my office, it just simply doesn't work. It's not powerful enough. For whatever reason, it's just not the tool that gets the job done quickly in a way that we uh, need to uh, do in order to control panic and agoraphobia. So the more direct route of GABA boosting is to use medicines that are called the benzodiazepines. The benzodiazepines, as a class, all boost GABA. Now, the medicines have names that you've heard of. Valium, Xanax, Valium, Clonopin. Those are my four uh, routine tools that I use to boost GABA. And again, people call these anti-anxiety medicines. Well, the medicines don't know if you're anxious. And I don't think that they're really anti-anything. They're not anti-anxiety. Anxiety gets better when you get your GABA boosted, so I call them boosters. These are your GABA boosters. So, if, um, if you are, as the thumbnail says, if you're unhappy that I put your wife on Valium, well, here's the deal. I'm not trying to get your wife addicted to Valium. And if you think that a Valium is an addictive drug and a bad drug and something that someone shouldn't take, well, that's actually sort of that mental health bias as opposed to the medical truth. The medical problem of low GABA, you need a chemical, you need a medicine that boosts GABA. And those most effective for those are the benzodiazepines. And that's what these are. Some people call them benzos. And oftentimes that's, a, that's sort of a negative. Hey, man, that guy's on benzos. Well, I'll tell you what, if that guy needs his GABA boosted and I'm giving him the benzodiazepine, I'll defend it and he should defend it too. It's not a problem with that. What's the problem with medicines like Valium and Xanax and Clonopin? Well, the problem is that people shouldn't be taking them or taking them. 
And that's where we have a problem with the benzos. It's not the people that medically need them. And unfortunately, uh, society then takes all of my patients who successfully are treated for their GABA shortage with, uh, with benzodiazepines, and a lot of times they treat them differently. Whether it's a friend, a family member, sometimes even a pharmacist will say, hey, I don't want to prescribe, I'm not going to fill that prescription for a benzo for you. And my question is, well, why not if it's what they need medically? It's a complicated story, and it really is all about the bias that a lot of people still have and the stigma that people still um, have to deal with with uh, brain chemistry problems in the so-called mental health arena. Benzos should not be taken by people that have normal GABA. Here's why. If your GABA is normal, not low, if I just put you here, there's your GABA. Your GABA is normal, not low. You're not suffering panic attacks. Just somebody gave them some of your volume and you took it. Well, guess what happens? Your GABA goes too high. I'll do the old Bugs Bunny exclamation point there, representing a problem. What, what happens when your GABA goes too high? Well, you feel drunk. You feel impaired. You feel sluggish. Some people hate that feeling. Some people love that feeling. And if you love feeling sort of drunk and you are able to get benzos from somebody that shouldn't be giving them to you, of course, you shouldn't be taking them in the first place because they're not yours and you don't have a GABA shortage in the first place. But if you're doing that, then you're basically becoming intoxicated with a GABA booster, with the benzodiazepine in the same way that you could you know, have three martinis or a case of beer. The difference with this and the reason some people get attracted to it and the reason that um, GABA boosters really have a bad addictive potential is that you don't have as much hangover as you have with alcohol. So the people that should not be using Valium, Clonopin, Xanax, and um, Ativan, I guess I wrote, sorry, I wrote, I wrote uh, Valium on here twice. Ativan is my fourth one. If you shouldn't be on these medicines, you're taking them, number one, you're breaking the law. Number two, you're causing a problem for everybody else. The problem you're causing for everybody else is you're given my medicines, the medicines we use to help legitimate cases of GABA shortage. You're causing a problem for those people. And that's not going to make you stop. What's going to stop is you getting arrested. And we have ways of catching people when they're misusing their medicines. So that's, that's you know, people end up getting caught using benzodiazepines recreationally. But it still makes it difficult for everyone else. And unfortunately, sometimes it leads to either the stigma, family member, friends saying, hey, I don't like you taking that stuff. And I've absolutely had family members say, I don't want you putting my wife on Xanax. Or I don't want you putting my wife on Valium. Or I don't want you putting my kid on Ativan. Well, I don't want any of this either. But if you've got cancer, I don't want to give you chemo. I don't want you to be sick. I don't want you to lose your hair. But I want you to get what you need. I want the cancer cells dead. In a situation where you have low GABA, I want that GABA up, and that's the only way to fix that problem. If Buspar really fixed it, and Buspar is not a benzodiazepine, and Buspar doesn't have any addictive potential, and certainly we can use other medicines for anxiety, that sometimes have help, uh, helpful effects, and we can talk about those in other videos. But when I choose to use a benzodiazepine, it's not because I'm a GABA, um, it's not because I'm a benzodiazepine guy, or that this is a candy store that I'm trying to get people addicted to medicine. I want only the people that need it to take it. And that's the people that have a legitimate GABA shortage. And those are the people that have legitimate panic and agor agoraphobia condition. So that's the medical truth about, um, about GABA shortage and about panic and about who should be taking medicines like uh, clonopin, Valium, Xanax, and Ativan, medicines that we call benzodiazepines. If a nurse practitioner or primary care doctor, family doctor, internal medicine doctor is prescribing these medicines for you, I hope that helps you understand why you're taking them. A lot of times, I think people get put on the medicines and they don't even really know why. They're just told, maybe you'll feel better. Uh, I hope this helps you understand the GABA shortage and the medical treatment for GABA shortage a little better. If you're a treating physician, by definition, whether you're a nurse practitioner, a PA, um, a doctor of any kind, if you are writing, if you have legal authority to write prescriptions, I hope that this information helps you. And if you're a patient and you don't think that your doctor understands it, then maybe you should have them watch this video too. As usual, if you subscribe and like the channel, that's the algorithm for Google that helps push this information to the top of the searches. So for example, if you said, I just had a panic attack or I've got panic disorder, what do I do? 
rather than just type that in and get layers and layers and layers of answers. It brings us to a common sense, uh, hopefully, session for you to get some real information from a guy who's been doing this for 30 years. I hope this helps you, and I hope that you come back for more. I'm Dr. Dave, psychiatry. Thanks for coming to see me.